So welcome to the September meeting of the Rochester Chapter of Imaging Science and Technology. We put on these meetings uh, roughly once a month uh, through the school year, and um, we appreciate having people who are interested give us their name and email address, and uh, maybe even become members, consider supporting the continuation of the series. Thanks, Bruce. I'd like to introduce Pat Cosgrove, uh, somebody who I've known for a number of years. I first met him when uh, trying to figure out how to optimize digital camera workflow into printing services. Fast forward, I saw a lot of Pat's posts on LinkedIn, these images. And, and uh, if you ever look through a telescope with binoculars, the night sky, you see these things and, and uh, uh, well, what I saw from Pat online blew my socks off. So uh, uh, he was kind enough when I asked him to, uh, to come through with this presentation, describing how you go from something you can buy in your own home uh, at the end of your driveway to these amazing images, which make it into uh, some uh, publications and other things. So Pat, thanks so much for coming here and sharing this with us. And we're very interested in what you got to say. Well, thanks so much for the invitation to talk here today. I'm kind of surprised in a way, because up to four years ago, I hadn't really ever taken an astrophoto, at least not one that was worth looking at or sharing with anyone else. Some people retire and they buy a fishing boat. Uh, I retired and I bought telescopes. <laughs> and when I started, I really didn't know what I was doing because when I used to be um, active in astronomy, it was 30 years ago. It was film, <laughs> whole different world, different technology, different set of problems. And when I tried to do imaging then, it was not pretty. So as I started, there's a whole new raft of technologies. I was like a kid in a candy shop. At first, I finally got to the point where I could make bad images. That is actually a very good milestone because it means the equipment's working, data's flowing through it, and you're doing something with the data. Maybe not the right things, but something. Then I got average images, and now my images are a little bit better. And they started to get recognized recently. I'm getting more of them published. I'm getting more attention from them. So... I'm happy to take some time today and share with you a little bit of what it's like to try to create one of these images. All right, so today um, the title is Capturing the Universe from My Driveway because that's where all my imaging comes from. So obviously we're gonna talk about astrophotography. And the fact is right now it's possible to capture images from your driveway that actually look as good or in many cases better than what professional observatories with huge telescopes used to do not that long ago. It's possible, but it's not easy. There's an awful lot of hurdles they have to get through in order to get to the point where you're getting some quality data and some quality images. So my goal here today is to share what that looks like by taking one of my projects and kind of walking through it from soup to nuts so you can get a feel for that. One caveat I should mention that I often mention on my webpage and on my YouTube page is that uh, I can't necessarily tell you best way or even the right way. All I can really do is show what I do. It seems to work for me, but you know, your mileage might vary. Astrophotography is a really huge topic. And I've got a little over an hour here to try to share some things with you. So expect this to be not really a technical talk and it's going to be very wide and very shallow. There's more details on my website and on my YouTube channel where I do a lot of deep dives in the whole system, specific components and specific challenges. And I document how I did every single image that's on the website. So um, if you're interested, please feel free to go look. So this is what I'm gonna to try to cover today, briefly. The domain, a little bit about me, my observatory, the target that we are gonna go after, the gear, the plan, the setup, the capture, the pre-processing, the processing, and the final result. And this image has nothing to do necessarily with this list. It's just one I really like and I had to fill up the page. I particularly like this one because a lot of peop people take pictures of um, Andromeda Galaxy. I did this a little bit different as I captured it in broadband, but I also went back and got a narrowband signal of hydrogen gas emission. Folded that in, and if you look carefully on the arms, you see these little pink knots. And those are areas of rapid star formation that are happening in the spiral arms. And so I've always been kind of proud of that particular image. Okay, let's talk about the domain. What I do is deep sky imaging, and it's really focusing on nebulae and clusters that are in our galaxy and other galaxies. There's other branches of astro imaging, which I don't do. Could be oh, solar imaging, lunar imaging, comets, uh, asteroids, all kinds of things. They have very different problems, use different equipment, different methodologies, 
and it's very different than what I do. What I tend to focus on is faint subjects that are far away. And if you look at the top two pictures, there's two samples of nebulae which are found in our galaxy. Nebulae like that typically are found somewhere between 2,000 and say 15,000 light years away. At the bottom there are two galaxies, the Pinwheel Galaxy and the Triangulum Galaxy. Galaxies are much further away. We're talking millions of years, 2 million to 100 million light years away. So we're really looking at ancient photons. Photons that left their, their source many, many years ago. We're looking into the past when we see these images. So what are some key enablers for doing deep sky astrophotography? Well, you, you have to have an interest because there's a lot to learn. You have to have drive because there's a lot you're going to have to learn as you go through. You better have a few dollars because you have to buy some toys and string them together in order to do this. You have to have access to the sky, which sounds kind of obvious, but if you're living in a city, that can be a problem. This quality of the sky may not be good. I built on my particular lot because it had lots of luscious trees on it. Now I wish that were not the case because I look at the sky through holes. So that's something I'm trying to work with. It's really good to have a supportive spouse because you're going to be up all night and you're going to be working crazy hours on a project that they could care less about. Most important thing to have, though, is time. So just walking you through a typical imaging project that I work with, the planning. I can spend over two hours just planning what object I'm going to take, how I'm going to go at it, what my exposures will be, when I'm going to have to pick it up, what telescope I should be using with it, a little history on the object, look what other people did when they imaged that scope. So there's a lot of time in the planning. Then I got to set up my gear in the driveway and take it down every night. Right now that takes me about an hour and a half. It's only because I really optimized that process and you'll see that a little bit later. Uh, then the capture. Usually my projects, I need three to five nights of clear in order to get enough information. I want more, but the weather gods in Rochester will never provide that to me. A five night stream of clear nights is almost unheard of. Processing can take me anywhere from one to three days, depending on how many images and what kind of imaging I'm doing. Every one of those projects gets fully documented uh, on my website, and that can take me one to three more days. I think I'm about the only person out there that for every image, I'll give you every step of everything I've done, including every processing stuff annotated. There are people who offer that service as a premium paywall thing. I don't do that. I, I, this is my way of giving back. A lot of people help me to learn, and I'm trying to let other people learn. So that takes me, you know, so this is about 11 days for a particular project. So you better have time. Uh, when I was working and had kids at home, didn't have that kind of time. So what makes deep sky imaging hard? Targets are very small and very faint. That means you have to worry about how much flux you can capture. So how, how much of a bucket do you have to catch those photons? That means you really want to make sure the quantum efficiency of your camera and your filters are optimized for that particular situation. That means you need longer exposures. When you have longer exposures, that means you have to be able to, to manage noise and thermal buildup and a lot of other problems. Can, can you spitball in uh, photons per second or per minute, the kind of things you're looking at, what's it sort of range? Uh, I don't know if I can answer that question. Okay. Few. <laughs> Very few. Now, I'll give you a feel of what a captured image looks like later on. It'll give you a real sense of most of the time is spent teasing signal from the, the uh, noise floor. It's very, very tenuous for part of the image. And you got stars, which are bright, right, in the same image. So it makes it kind of difficult. Second problem is the Earth turns. So now you're, you're looking at this thing. You want a long exposure, and it's swinging out of view. So you have to have things like computer-guided mounts. And you have to have guiding systems, which act like the boss that keeps an eye on the mount to make sure the mount's doing its business, right? Then the night is not always dark, clear, clear as smoke or even very long, right? We get the moon in the way and forget about deep sky imaging. It brightens up the sky too much. In terms of uh, clouds and smoke, you have to have good tools to predict when you're gonna have that window that'll let you play those games. And in the summertime, well, you only get four hours. So you better decide what you're gonna do with those four hours. Very different than the fall when we get much longer things. The other problem you run into is that the night gets colder as it goes on. This has a couple of impacts, right? It makes the astrophotographer shiver, that's one. Uh, a second impact though is just the fact that it gets cold enough that all the metal on the telescope shrinks. 
and it'll destroy your focus. And so you're going to need to do something about that. It gets cold enough that moisture starts to do out on your lenses, and you're going to have to deal with that. So there, are, these are all problems that have to be solved. Every problem does have a fix. Unfortunately, most of the fixes have their own problems, which have a fix, which unfortunately have their own problems. So part of this is building your system and learning how to work with it to maximize what you're doing with it. Okay, let's talk about the astrophotographer. This is a snapshot from my YouTube channel, which shows you how much I don't know about video. <laughs> uh, and if that doesn't scare you away, so most of you know I have a background in image science and consumer imaging systems, but more importantly, I've had a long-term interest in astronomy. I, I was really involved with visual astronomy 30 years ago. I was very involved with the astronomy section of the Rossiter Academy of Science, and I was doing an awful lot then. And Frank knows that since he just reminded me he bought one of my first telescopes. Uh, it still has it. But something changed, and all that kind of fell away. I ended up getting a new job with more responsibility. I went back to grad school, built a house, and we started a family all in the same year. And suddenly there wasn't enough time for anything, and those things fell away. But you know, I always knew I would return to astronomy because I still have this real sense of wonder for the night sky. But in my mind, that, that was going to be when I had time. And time was when I was retired. And I knew that would be the best way to go about that. And sure enough, within 30 days of retirement, I had my first rig, and I was ready to start going. And this is the first rig that I got. i got to tell you how this happened a little bit. I did a lot of research, and I thought about a 5-inch refractor was a good size. It was big enough that you caught a lot of photons, but not so big that I couldn't lift it. The uh, mount that I picked out was a not a high-end, but a medium-end uh, go-to mount. It looked like a good combination of things, but I wasn't sure they'd all be compatible and work together. But one of the vendors of Astro Gear has a technical call in line. So I told my wife I was exploring this, and I was going to call and talk to them, just see what they could recommend. So I called and talked to them, and I said, yeah, good choices. They'll work together. This is great. I said, what about the availability? I've been hearing the supply chain, and this is really tough. It's hard to get these things. He goes, yes, but it's murder. He says, but you know that scope? I have one right now that just came in. No one's got their name on it, if you're interested. And, and that mount, impossible to get. But we finally are getting a shipment from the manufacturer, and we've got one more coming in than we have back orders for. You know, if you wanted, you could lock those down right now, and you could have it in a couple of weeks. So I took out my credit card, and I gave it to the guy. And so I ended up, as I was saying earlier, I sold a whole bunch of camera lenses to help fill that $5,000 hole in the ground that I created in our finances. But this particular scope, it's about a 5.1, 5.2 inch apochromatic refractor. I have a small guide scope on it. The mount is a Ioptron CM60, rated for a 60 pound load. And I've got a, a one shot color camera on it. One shot color cameras are basically sensors with a Bayer pattern on it. And so every image you capture has color components in it. Really good way to start because it simplifies capture, calibration, and processing. I didn't stay with it very long because when you go mono, there's a lot more you can do. So I learned to put it together, and I got my very first astro image. And this is it. This is Messier 8, the Lagoon Nebula. This was the result of 14 one-minute exposures that were stacked together with some free software that I didn't understand how to use. It's not in focus because I didn't quite understand how to get a good focus yet. It wasn't guided because, well, that's a whole subsystem I hadn't even figured out how to turn on yet. No calibration frames, just raw data. And finally, where's my color? It's black and white. This is a one-shot color camera. Now it turns out you got to sort of tell the software that there's a Bayer pattern, there's a specific pattern, and then it will extract the color. But I wasn't smart enough at that point to do that. But you know what? None of it mattered because I was completely hooked by this one image. This one image, I saw more detail in that particular object than I've ever seen with a very large telescope. And so... Once you're getting images off your system, now you can start working on your technique. And so in the next month, I started capturing more images. This is the topic of today's talk. This is my very first picture of the Dumbbell Nebula. And that's pretty close to what you see in a small telescope. Um, maybe not colorful because your eyes don't have uh, enough sensitivity with your cones. You're seeing it with your rods. And then there's the Crescent Nebula. This is called the Witch's Broom. And then this is the Eagle Nebula. And right in the center right here is 
the Pillars of Creation, very famous image done by the Hubble Space Telescope. Backgrounds are all clipped. Stars have no color. Every frame in here is a different color because I was using Photoshop, which turns out to be a pretty poor tool for doing this kind of data reduction. Didn't matter. I was getting images the first time, and I was seeing things I never saw. It, every image got me excited for the next one. Then I shot this about a month in. So this is the Andromeda Galaxy. It's 40 minutes, two and a half million light years away. I thought that looked cool. I thought it had a lot of impact and drama. It was big. It filled the screen. Sent it to my kids. My oldest son came back and he said, you took this? Oh, yes. Yes, I did. Kept working on it and my technique improved. And over time, I started getting images that I was much more excited about. That's the Wizard Nebula. That was taken about a year after the other ones. This one is one of my first images that I processed with starless methods. I shot it as a narrow band and an RGB image. And I used the nebula from the narrow, narrow band and the RGB stars, put it together. And so I was doing much more sophisticated processing. This is the Rosette Nebula, kind of zoomed in, seen in narrow band colors. This was the first image I ever had published. This was published in Astronomy Magazine on the January 2022 issue. This is called the North American Nebula. So this is North America. This is the Gulf of Mexico. You can sort of see the shape in there if you squint and look at it just right. You can also see over here the Pelican Nebula. Here's the body of the pelican. Here's his neck. There's his head and his eye and his beak sticking out right there. That was published in Sky and Telescope magazine in October of 2022. Sky and Telescope is notoriously difficult to get into. It was my first image there. They put it as a two-page two -page spread, so I was pretty excited by that. This is called the Elephant's Trunk. It's in the constellation Cepheus. Uh, that was published in Amateur Astrophotography magazine in November of 2022. No one's published this one, but this is the Bat Nebula. And it is just a beautiful, beautiful nebula full of gossamer details and filaments. And it's just such a tenuous glass, a gas cloud that's glowing. And it's just, just a beautiful object. Here's another shot of Medjay 16 and the Pillars of Creation. This one came out better. And this is one of my favorite early images. I have a great big metal print of this that I made at home. Uh, but this was published in uh, Amateur Astrophotography Magazine in this year, earlier. So... Astrophotographers typically go through a journey. They start by acquiring gear, right? You got to have that gear to start. By the way, that phase never ends, ever. Then you get your very first images. And from there, you get start working on it, making sure that you, the data you're collecting is perfect. The guiding is perfect. The stars are nice and round. The exposures are just right. And you can with some effort, start to plateau on that pretty soon. You can get good quality and consistent quality. Then you start worrying about the image processing. You will never end, end that learning curve. There's so much to learn. There's so many different situations which need different treatments. And, and every time you think you've got it mastered, new tools come along and new methods come along and there's just more to learn. And you get excited because it lets you do things and go places you couldn't have gone before. Then this thing happens that I talk about, you develop your inner eye. Every astrophotographer has a look to their images, which is unique to them. I have this thing I call Cosgrove's Law that says that if I took a, one data set and gave it to 10 different astrophotographers, I would come back with 10 excellent images that look completely different from one another, yet would be consistent with the quality and the signature looks that they produce. And it's just something that sort of develops. It's how you look at the data, how you make the decisions to make changes to the data, how you think the data should look and how you're going to go about bringing that look about. It, there's, there's a bit of art that's involved in that. And so just talking about that learning journey, I showed you this first version of the Crescent Nebula I shot. This is the one I did this year. And I was particularly proud of that one because I was able to get the oxygen shell that wraps around, and that's very difficult to get. And I was able to get it in a lot of detail, so much so that I was surprised that in the bottom you can see these convection cells where there's gas voids from expanding gas, and I didn't even know they were there. Okay, so I started with one telescope. I have three now. These are my three telescopes. These are kind of like adult Legos. <laughs> They get festooned with, with gear, and everyone has their own way of mounting and getting them going. But the one all the way over on the right is my small scope. It's a Richfield astrograph. 
Uh, it's 400 millimeter uh, focal length, and it covers about two and a half by two degrees field. So it's a pretty big uh, field that size. My guy over here has a focal length of 1085, and it covers about half the field of the other. And the first telescope that I bought is 740 uh, millimeters, and they, it falls right in the middle there. So this was pretty purposeful because some objects out there are huge. Like I showed you a picture of the Andromeda galaxy. That's the size of a couple full moons. It's just faint. You need a wide field of view. Others, like a planetary nebula, are very small. You need to get the highest magnification you can get in order to deal with it. So part of my planning is, well, you know, when is this object available? Which scope does it go in? Is that scope already slated to capture an object? And then is there a collision in my scheduling? That's where things get complicated. So, so there's no eyepiece that like you would lay your No. Mind. Some people take the camera off and put an eyepiece on. I don't. It's a sealed system now. Dust doesn't get in. Um, everything's the, all the, the, the distances are pre precisely set. I don't want to mess with that unless I have to. So the observatory, this is not my observatory. <laughs> so, this is my observatory. <laughs> it's my driveway. And the first picture there, you can see I'm looking north. And as I look north, I, uh, over the driveway, I see the gap in the trees, a tree line to the east, tree line to the west. An object will come out of the east trees and I can track it until it crashes into the other tree line. And that is what I can take pictures with. The other picture is facing north. And when you're facing north, you're facing Polaris, right? The pole star, the north star. It, you have to because you, when you're setting gear up every night, you have to align with that star or at least use that star as a reference to get the right alignment so that your drive is turning in the way that it should be. Except that's not a convenient hole. That hole is created by tree guys with chainsaws hanging for ropes. And they cut that hole so that I could see that. And just a bit of transparency here, that's not an actual image of Polaris, just an incredible simulation. <laughs> so you got to know what you're dealing with. So there's free software out there that's a planetarium software, and it'll tell you what object is what part of the sky at any night, any time. I just mapped out my tree line, put it in there, and now I know when something is going to clear my tree line and when it's going to set my tree line. And... Um, it used to be about a three-hour window. Right now it's four because I paid tree guys to trim back the trees a little bit on each side. So I got a little bit more time out of it. But I need to have this because I need to know what's coming up when, when I can shoot it, when I lose it, and then what's coming up afterwards so I can go to the next target. So that's my observatory. Everything's set up in the driveway. They're all facing north because I have to align with the North Star first when it gets dark. There are three computers sitting on the various carts. Each one is driving a telescope. Uh, these are reconditioned, cheap uh, HP office laptops that are fine for running what I have to run. And then I have two fans, one on each table. Anybody want to guess why the fans are there? This is my anti-mosquito defense system. You're going to be standing there typing during mosquito season. You don't want to be there without a fan going. <laughs> so that was my way of dealing with it. So you can tell this is happening in uh, probably uh, July. So let's talk about our target, okay? M27 is in the constellation of Vipecula, the little fox. It's probably the constellation that nobody knows because its figure is two stars with a line between them. Not very easy to pick out. But it is sort of sandwiched between Cygnus the Swan and Aquila the Eagle. So that part makes it an interesting part of the sky. But what is it? Let's talk about it. This is a... This is my more recent image of M27 using broadband RGB color to image it. And what we're really dealing with here is uh, a planetary nebula. Uh, it's also known as NGC 6853. And it's also sometimes called the apple core because the ends bit look like an apple with that's been bit out, right? It's a planetary nebula. It's about 1,200 light years away. It's the first planetary nebula ever discovered, and it was discovered by Charles Messier. You notice its other name is Messier 27. Messier has a list of objects. So you think, wow, this Messier guy went around finding these fascinating things and made a list of them. Well, that's not exactly what happened. He didn't care about these things. He cared about comets. And he'd be scanning the sky looking for a comet, and he'd see this fuzzy thing and say, a comet! And then he would study it night after night, and it never moved relative to the background sky. It's not a comet. False positive. So he created a list of these annoying things that got in the way of his trying to find comets, shared it with all the other comet hunters in, at the time, 
Uh, today, it's 110 of the brightest and most interesting objects in the sky. For him, it, they were obstacles to be avoided. So we also know that this thing's about 10,000 years old. We've had pictures of it now for almost 100 years. It's changed in size. And based on the expansion rate, we know that this thing formed about, uh, about 10,000 years ago. So what's a planetary nebula? It's really the expanding shells of ionized gas from red giant stars. And stars that are of moderate mass between one and eight solar masses will go through a phase where they expand into red giants. And at the very end of their life, they'll expend the outer gas shells. The core of the star becomes a white dwarf and will irradiate with UV radiation that shell and it begins to glow. And that's what makes it uh, noticeable by us. The sun is likely to go down this path, but probably long after we're gone. It plays an important role in galactic chemical evolution because through nucleosynthesis, hydrogen in the stars converted to heavier elements. This stuff that's thrown out in the gas cloud is a lot of molecular and heavy elements. That forms new planets, new solar systems, new stars, and us, the old Carl Sagan, we are star stuff. That's where the stuff comes from. And they're called planetary nebula because in early telescopes, they could resolve a disk form, which is what a planet looks like, but they quickly realized they weren't real planets. They weren't moving like a planet moves. But they, are, they, they were called planetary nebula, and they are to this day. So my goal in this project was I didn't want to shoot a broadband because I've already done that. I didn't want to do RGB. I was going to do a narrowband image. I wanted to do a really long integration, get as much detail as I can. But I saw a few pictures of like this, this guy took back in 2010, where there's this gas shell around it that you don't normally see. And I thought that was fascinating. I want to see if I could bring out the detail of that shell. That was the whole, uh, you know, driving force for my particular project here. Okay, let's talk about my gear. And this is not my gear. And we've already shown this a little bit, but let me sort of walk through what we have here. Then I'll talk about each piece in a little bit more detail. We start off with the scope. You know, everybody knows what a scope looks like, and everybody knows at the back end of a scope, there's a focuser, some rack and pinion thing that allows you to bring the eyepiece to focus, or in this case, the camera, the focus. I have a little blue box there, which is a focus motor, so I can automate that. Behind it, there's a blue flange. That blue flange is a camera rotator. It allows me to rotate the, uh, the camera at any angle I want very precisely and, and on a command. Behind that is the filter wheel, and a mono camera. And we'll talk more about that in a moment. Now, all of that is sitting on top of a computerized go-to mount. And right now, it's pointing towards the north. And that axis has to be lined up really carefully with the, with the north, or else um, you're not going to track accurately. There's a little nub that will be uh, at the end of the axis there. That's a little camera, an independent camera, that's looking at the north star and helps me to get precise positioning of the polar alignment. On top of that, you'll see a complete telescope system with his own camera. Okay, he's the boss. He watches what the other guy's doing. And if he sees it fall down on the job, not tracking the way it should, he sends control signals override and gets things back on track before the camera ever notices. So this, this is my astrophysics uh, uh, telescope. It was built in uh, 2003. Very difficult to get telescope. Astrophysics used to be that you couldn't even get on a waiting list. You would go in and you put your name in. They would put it in a lottery. Once a year, they draw a certain number of names out of the lottery. Those guys got on a waiting list, and you could wait three to five years for your telescope to be built. If you have time afterwards, ask me how I came across this telescope. It's a, it's a story in itself, but I'm, my talk is already long, so I'm not going to go there now. But it's, it has beautiful optics, and with the longer, longest focal length, I have the best image scale for dealing with what we want to deal with on this project. It's not a particularly fast scope. It's a F83.5. So obviously, the whole point here is for the scope to be uh, a light bucket. Now, if M27 is in our skies, it's bathing every inch of the Earth with photons that it's sending in our direction. And if we're looking at it with our eyes, the, pupil, the exit pupil of your eyes, five to seven millimeters, you're not really going to see much, right? But with a 130 millimeter scope, that's a gain of about 345. We're, we're changing the flux that we'll be able, able to capture and focus onto the sensor. It also provides a magnification. So it's about 22x over a standard 50 millimeter lens, for example. 
And here's our focus motor. It's a really high torque motor, very precise in how it moves. And it uh, also holds its position once moved there really rigidly. Once it locks into a position, it's not moving. And that's a property you really want. When this is used in conjunction with a camera and some control software, it gives you a form of autofocus, which is really critical if you want sharp images over the length of an entire night. And basically what the control software does is, if it says it wants to do an autofocus run, it backs off the focus a certain number of steps, takes a picture, looks at the picture, finds all the stars, and creates a metric of the star size. And then it moves it a little bit further down and takes another picture. And then it creates this plot. And obviously, it's showing how you're approaching focus because the star size is getting smaller and smaller. And then all of a sudden, it gets bigger again So when you go past it. It puts a curve through it and can very precisely figure out what the right focus point is. It does this when you start the system. It does this when you change filters, because filters can have different refraction indexes. Changes when the temperature changes more than a degree. Could be a different, but I have it down for one degree. And for me, every 30 minutes, whether you need it or not, do another focus run. How long does that process take? On um, RGB, with broadband filters, it can take 20 seconds. Uh, with narrowband filters, since they're very, they have very tight cuts and not as much light comes through, they need longer exposures. So it takes maybe three or four times that. But there's almost no way to visually focus narrowband because the light level is so low. You almost need to have something like this. All right. And there's our, uh, there's our camera rotator. And the camera rotator is really nice if you're taking multiple images of different objects over multiple nights because you can dial back to a particular orientation from a previous night. But even better, I can sit down the afternoon before and I can compose my image in daylight and then command that composition be executed when we're really running things. So here's my control software. On the first screen, what I've done is I said, I'm, I'm put in an object. This happens to be the Tulip Nebula. And it goes to a research survey plate, pulls up the image of that, and shows me what it looks like. Now I draw a, a, a rectangle on it and I'll get to the second screen. And it snaps to the exact size of the field covered for this telescope on this camera. I can now move it around to figure out the centering, and I can rotate it to get just the composition I want. It will take that, it will pull it in, and it will be part of the command sequence to control the, the exposures when we're ready to start. So now we get to the camera. Well, I'm using mono cameras now because there's enormous flexibility in what you can do, and there's also some advantages to not having a Bayer pattern on the, the sensors itself. But that means you also need a filter wheel. And a filter wheel is has seven filters on it, and I can command it to take any filter I want when I want. This particular camera is the next generation technology, and there's huge differences just in one generation. The previous generation camera had a quantum efficiency peak of about 60%. And I'm going to show you a plot of that in a second. This one comes in at 91%. So it's a very efficient camera. I have two of them, and I have another one. Someday I'll swap that out as well, but I'm not quite there yet. So when people are doing this kind of photography, they have a choice. Some people use a regular uh, digital still camera. Some people even take a digital still camera and modify the sensors to take off uh, infrared and UV filters that are in front of it. Or you can get a dedicated astro camera. And they can be one-shot cameras, which have a Bayer pattern, or a mono camera. They also have another choice in that they come in cooled versions and non-cooled versions. When you're doing planetary photography, where the light is relatively bright by comparison, you don't have exposures long enough where you need cooling. But for deep sky, you need cooling, and that's an important attribute. So I ended up with mono cameras, cooled, obviously, and uh, with a filter wheel. There's the filter wheel. Taking the cover off. Those are the filters, and there are seven filters. The first four are broadband filters, LRGB. So it lets me do traditional uh, capture of, of broadband uh, RGB color. And then I have three narrowband, and we'll take a look at what narrowband really means. The first plot, you can see the broadband. This is pretty typical. 100 nanometer wide swatches going through the red, green, and blue. The luminous one is one that spans the entire space. So it lets in a lot of light. And often you'll take faint exposures with a luminance channel and then get enough color to color that luminance image when it comes in. On the other hand, on the other plot, you can see the narrow bands. These are 100 nanometers wide. Those are three, five, or seven nanometers wide. Very, very narrow. 
And their peaks are lined up spectrally with certain molecular clouds that are common in the universe that get excited and emit light at a very specific frequency. Um, it lets through those frequencies so you can focus on that and you get amazing detail from that. More importantly, it rejects everything else. A lot of light coming in your scope has nothing to do with astronomy. It has to do with light pollution. It has to do with atmospheric glow. This stuff cuts all that out. And even though it reduces the overall light level, what you get is a much better signal coming through. Uh, when you see the block filters, there's no, no, there's no attempt to be any of like, the matching functions. No. I mean, when you think about astronomy, when they um, get a sensor, they're not big enough market to build one. So they build, they buy sensors that are used in cameras in more traditional applications. So same thing going on a camera, camera, you know, I mean, it's not a can Canon sensor, but like a lot of the Sony sensors, they're used here, they're used in cameras, right? They just don't have enough market power to get anything unique. Well, I just mean, just put the color, the filters you put on. Yes, the filters you go on, but you also, um, the market there is, the cost of the filters is as much as the camera. So you, you typically get people who are trying to get the filters that are more commonly associated with the molecular clouds that are in nebulae. There are other ones you can get, and people do, but after you bought these, which you pretty much have to have, a lot of people don't have a lot of budget left, or slots in their filter wheel to do the others. But there are people who are doing experiments with different kinds of cuts and looking at different things, but they're in a minority, I would say, at this point. Okay, so in this camera, so it's a CMOS. It happens to be uh, a, a, a Sony sensor. It's an APS-C format, so it's not a full-frame camera, which is good because at the edge of the field, things get ugly in optics. So having it a little bit smaller is not necessarily a bad thing. It has a full 16-bit ADC, so it really has a full range. Older cameras are really 12-bit or 14-bit cameras that are mapped to a 16-bit range, so it's not really the true signal. We talked about the chroma efficiency being 91%, which is a huge gain, really important. The other thing that's really important is uh, it has a 50 electron, 50,000 electron volt well capacity. Previous ones had 20. So you're taking exposure, you have stars, the stars will fill up the wells and they'll saturate really quickly. This it takes a lot longer exposure before those things saturate. So this next generation camera is really quite nice. Is that what dictates the length of the innovation time when this uh, first star to saturate? Yes. I mean, the, the, you want to get as much exposure as you can without blowing out too many stars. And then the question is, how many of those exposures can you get? And that's what builds up the signal. Well, there's the mount. We talked about that. Its job is to counteract the motion of the Earth. And to do that, it has a very precise gear drive mechanism. But no drive mechanism is perfect. And at the magnifications we're using, imperfections in specific teeth in the gear will show itself. And that's why we need other systems to help compensate when those things don't go as well as we would like it to go. It's a 60 pound load and you could handle a 60 pound load if you're doing visual work. For photographic, nobody does that. Rule of thumb is you use half the weight. So my tube assembly weighs about 30 pounds. It's all sitting on a pier and that pier is a real strong pier, but because it truly is a pier, it makes it easy for picking up the scope and moving it. And I'll show you that in a little bit. This is the polar alignment camera that I told you about before. All it does is look at the sky, sees where Polaris is. It does something called plate solving. I haven't talked about that yet. Plate solving is magic. You, you're, you set up your, your, your mount. It thinks it knows where it's looking. You tell it to go to a place and it thinks it's pointing there. You take a picture and then the computer takes that picture looks at the stars in it and compares it to a database of all stars and says, that's not what you're looking at. You're over there. Man, are you way the heck off? And we'll actually recalibrate them out. And there's a process where it'll bring it back in and make sure you're lined up. Well, that this uses plate solving as well. It looks at Polaris and the stars around it. And from that, it knows precisely where you want your scope pointing. And on the screen, it'll show you a little crosshair. It says, this is where you want it to be. This is where you are. You might want to move that over. And as you move it over, it actually jumps in scale and gets more and more precise. So you get very precise alignment with it very easily. The alternative is a scope that's built into that axis. To use it, I have to get on my knees and look up. And with my knees and my back, that was torture. I did that once and then bought three of these cameras and I, I use it in all my scopes. All right, so this is the boss. 
full telescope system and a camera. And there's software that basically watches the field. It watches multiple stars. And if you're guiding perfectly, those stars don't move. If they start to drift, or if there's some jitter because of a bad gear, it will recognize that, send control to the to drive to offset that, and move things back to center before the camera can register. And it's very fast and it's very, very smart. And that really is what delivers the high quality. And it makes up for some errors in alignment, some errors in drives. And it's a very critical subsystem. So do, we have a thermal res uh, resist strip around the elements. And on my telescope, I have an environmental module. It does real-time RH and temperature, calculates the dew point. As it becomes closer, it starts heating up just enough heat around the lens to keep the dew off, but not put too much heat on the lens because that's not good for imaging. So it's a very precisely controlled system. And finally, computers run everything. And the computers, like I said, I bought these for, I don't know, 200 bucks a pop, condition computers, put the same software on both. They run everything. And then I use AnyDesk so I can see their screens inside my house so I don't have to be out with mosquitoes or the cold unless there's something I have to do out there, which there are things I have to do. But for the most part, I can stay inside where it's warm and mosquito-free. And then finally, I use Dropbox. And every every time I have a new subframe come in, it goes to the cloud. I'm in my house. I can pull it in and start analyzing. Is this data looking good? Is there anything going wrong? So let's talk about planning. Well, you need a target. Astrophotographers are always looking at other people's pictures and finding cool things they want to shoot. So I have a long list of targets. They're only available certain times of the year, so I plan on using those. And you need dark skies, and that means you, you need to avoid the moon. So you can't just go out and do this any night. You have to look at what the phases of the moon are, and you really want to shoot, shoot for the new moon and a few days on either side. That's the only time you can go out. And then you got to worry about the length of the night. I only get about three hours exposure between my trees. It doesn't much matter in the summer when there's only four hours of darkness, right? But in the fall, where you had 10 or 11, I need more targets because I have time to do more targets. I have to worry about clear skies, clouds, and wind. I'm exposed out in the driveway. If it's windy night, the, the, the uh, telescope acts like a sail, and that's not good for things. Uh, astrophotographers have a whole bunch of apps they use that predict the weather. The one app I'm showing here right now actually goes off and looks at all of the competing uh, government weather models, reassess, reassesses them for your location every hour, and gives you a map of visibility, clarity, cloud content, everything. And so you can look at your odds for a particular night and know if this is going to be worth setting up all that gear. For me, I better have a clear night all night long. I'm not setting up this gear and worrying about it getting rained on, and I don't want to have to run out at 2 in the morning and bring it in quickly because it, it shut down. And then this year, we've had unprecedented levels of forest fires. All of Canada seems to be ablaze. We've seen smoke and smelled some smoke at the street level. Imagine how that feels when you're trying to look for clear skies. So this is actually showing some smoke plumes coming in from the Quebec wildfire. And we are actually between two big cloud systems. We would have had clear nights here. The smoke came in and filled that trough nice and neat. And all of a sudden, we don't have that. But one app that does all the weather prediction now has a new mode, which is smoke tracking. And it uses satellite images to predict where smoke is going to be any given night. So that's a new element of the weather. Geez, it's got to be new moon, good weather around here, and no smoke. Then maybe you can do something. There have been many days this year where we could do something. we got to figure out the rise and set times for the object. We already talked about that. And then this is the software that controls everything. This is called Sequence Generator Pro. It is the big kahuna. It, in one part of it, um, it connects to all of the gear and controls all of the gear and takes all the data from all of the gear and then uses it. But in the core, it has an event planner. And these events, I can have light events, flat calibration events, and dark calibration events. I can choose what filter, what exposure time, how I want the sensor uh, set up, and how many repeats I want to do. And it's going to start up and run all those sequences. Between the sequences, it'll move filters, it'll do focus runs. Between exposures, it'll do something called dithering, right? I just talked about how I don't want the, the tracking of the sky to, to change. I want the stars to be fixed position. 
But that's not entirely true. When I'm not, not taking an exposure, I'll jostle it a teeny bit. So when I start the next exposure, it's going to be sitting on the sensor slightly differently on slightly different pixel edges so that when I combine them, I'll actually get some synthetic resolution. So it handles dithering. If a cloud comes in, the tracking software doesn't see its stars anymore. It shuts down. This thing's smart enough to say, okay, I know what to do. Wait 15 minutes, come back and check it out again. Doesn't work, come back another 10 minutes. I do that for two hours, I can go to sleep. And it's going to try to recover. If the clouds move back out again, it'll recover and keep going. So it's a very smart piece of software. Okay, the setup. I got a setup for three scopes. There's a daylight setup, which is the physical setup. And I talked about in the past that was bringing out the pier, bringing out the mount, bringing out the weights, bringing out the scope, doing that for multiple scopes, and then taking them all back down again. I found a better way to do that. And at twilight, that's when I go out and I start getting all the software running and connected and ready to go. Then at dark, I can actually do important things just before imaging. I can do the polar alignment because I can see the stars now, right? I can test the cameras, I can cool the cameras, and I can run plate solver to make sure everything's calibrated in terms of what the pointing is. But the smarter way to do it is keep your scope completely assembled and balanced and set up, start in your garage, and then have something that grabs the scope, lifts it up, you wheel it out in the driveway, you drop it on magical spots on the driveway, and then when you go to put it back, you pick it up and put it back. Imagine the time savings, that is. And it cuts down on the uh, astrophotography aerobics of running back and forth with all the equipment. Uh, this was designed by Rick Albrecht. Some of you may know Rick. and I built it. He, he figured out what my build capability was and designed something I could build with the tools that I had. All right, I'm going to show a video. I realized after I set up one night, I have a security camera. It's triggered by motion. I bet you it took a picture of me when I was setting up. <laughs> so I pulled it out to... So this is the best way to convey what my setup looks like, at least for two scopes. The third scope is a light scope I can just pick up and drop. It's not a big deal. My little Astro cart has power distribution on it, power supplies on it. I put two computers there, and it has a little camera on it that I can steer around and look at things when I'm inside. Can you get an unexpected set of headlights going down your driveway and doing a uh, The only time that's happened was my wife once, and we knew it was happening, and she just had the parking lights, and I lost one frame. It wasn't too bad. We were recently looking for some land, and I wanted to see if it had dark skies, but it was a clear night. I set everything up, and I snuck out of the house, put this on auto, and I left for two hours, then came back. <laughs> turned off the headlights and came in, and everything had run perfectly while I was gone. So maybe it doesn't need me. It just you know needs to be left alone. All right. That gives you a little bit of feel for that without taking up more time. You're a fast mover. There we go. Okay. So this is what I see inside the house. I have two 32-inch um, 4K monitors. I have any, any desk so I can see the, each of the screens of the, the computers as they're working. And I can see my little steerable computer camera and uh, uh, the security camera. It has a mic on. I can listen to the drives. If something goes on, goes on with the drives, I can tell by the sound uh, that it's not right. This happens to be the night I collected the data for the project we're going to talk about. And here's one of the subs for that particular frame. I had two other objects being captured at the same time over here, the propeller nebula and the flame nebula. And they were all being done in parallel. Okay, the capture. So once I'm ready to go, I want to start the capture. I tell it to start. It Slews the target, autofocuses the camera, centers it on the location I want, and plate solves it, including rotation. Starts the guiding mechanism, and then does all the filter sequences, and then it'll shift over and do the flats. All of this I can leave alone, but when we get into the flats to do the darks, that's simple. I got to go out and I got to put a lens cap on. To do the lights or do the flats, I um, I need to put on a uh, flat light source, a uniform light source that lets me document the contribution of the optics of the system to the signal that's coming in. And the software knows how to do all this. And when it's doing iterative tasks, it'll actually show you doing them. You can see it dialing in, and you can sort of monitor the whole process pretty easily. We had a clear night here last week. I was finally had some new data. Here's what it looks like when you tell it to start up. 
So that's the fast slew speed. Not super fast, but it moves good enough with all that equipment. It'll lock down to the position. And then once it's locked there, I'll take an exposure. And then it'll iterate until it gets it exactly to where you want it to go. But I thought it'd just be good to give you a feel for what that sort of looks like. All right, I said I had to go out there and put on this flat light source. You can buy flat light sources designed for this. It costs several hundred dollars. I ended up buying an LED tracing screen from Amazon for 20 bucks, put two inch closed cell foam on it, cut a hole out, and I can put it on top of my scope out on the driveway and I can collect a series of flats with that. And that works just fine. Okay, the final data set. So this is captured last year. I ended up with exposure times about five minutes each. And I ended up with 39, 38, and 46 uh, subframes respectively for a total of about 10 hours of exposure time. And of course, all the calibration that I needed. I had dark frames that were 300 seconds because that was the duration of my, my subframe. And then I had a bunch of smaller or shorter dark frames to go along with the exposures used for the flat calibration. So I can calibrate that. Total 378 files for the whole project. What I see you took, you took multiple flats throughout the night. What, what, what is the thing which causes the flat to change? So I don't take them throughout the night. I take them for any orientation and every night. Obviously, the cosine fourth fall off the optics isn't going to change, but dust is in the system and dust is out of focus and has an impact. Since I'm moving the scope every night, some of that dust might jostle. Also, I'm rotating the camera, so I need to document where the dust is relative to the camera position so that for each object, each night, I do a flat exposure. Put the lens cap on, it really doesn't matter. <laughs> There's no signal, right? I, I don't have to worry about that. But that's how I get really good calibration for the optical components, especially dust. If it was so sealed and there was no dust in it, maybe I could get by with not doing it every night. This just guarantees that if there's any shift in dust, I've got things covered. One of the things I do once I have all this stuff is I look at them in a kind of a blink sequence. And as this is blinking through, you can see it's shifting position for that dithering. You might see some variation on um, the background as thin clouds come through. Take a look at this one. That's the oxygen signal. This is pretty clean data. Not a lot going on here. You and I live in a very nearby neighborhood, and uh, planes are constantly flying over my You're about to see one. Oh, very good. I'm not good. Here we get a little bit more clouds coming in. Oh. There's a plane that went right across. You'll get satellites. You'll get asteroids. you get planes. You know, think back to the old days with film. You had a four-hour exposure. And you're sitting there guiding manually for four hours, and the plane comes through, and you throw out the whole exposure because there's nothing you can do about it. Here, you throw out a frame at the worst. But now, nah, we don't even have to throw out the frame with a plane. We have ways of eliminating those pixel snouts. I'll we'll talk about that. Okay, the flat cal frames, that's what they look like. This is the cat, the, the uh, one of the cal frames from my data set. You see some slight fall off, a little bit of dust in here, but I got this from another guy's telescope. A lot more dust, <laughs> a lot more issues for it to deal with. But when I can document that, I can subtract that off as I'm doing the calibration. And this is what the dark frames look like. My dark frame looks pretty good, but the previous generation had a lot more hot pixels. And what you see in the corner there, there's a little amplifier circuit on the chip. That's amp glow. And it, that thermally pollutes the data. And you really have to you know, characterize that so you can subtract it off. So we got these light frames. What's in the light frames? Well, we have bias noise, which is electronic noise that you get from the A to D converter. I don't care if you have a picosecond exposure time, you're going to get some level of noise there. Then you have dark noise, which is dark current that's generated thermally. The longer you run that chip, the more it gets heated. And the more it gets heated, you'll get current going in there. And that generates noise. And you also get the on-chip uh, amp glow if you have that issue. Then you have the flat signal, which is dealing with dust and optical uh, issues. And finally, you have light signal. But the light signal could be light pollution, atmospheric glow, as well as light from the object you're taking pictures of. Can you see on sort of the bias noise, is that what I call a, a fixed pattern noise? Uh, it's not necessarily fixed. It's still noise, right? It's, it's random. But it's, it's, uh, if I shoot a one-second exposure, I'll get some noise. 
Sure. If I shot a 300 second exposure, I'll get noise, but the pattern's different because there's a different source of noise, thermal, that isn't in one. So you want to document both, right? So, so you don't have to go through a fixed pattern of this calibration for no. radiations and signal uh, no. by columns? Or no, if uh, the dithering helps with that too. If you had it, you had too much, you, you start to get fixed pattern noise, uh, walking noise, right, uh, that you, you start running into. Now we're ready to process the data. There's one software package which does pre-processing and processing that I use and most all serious astrophotographers use. It's called PixInsight. It's a professional level package. It's a very powerful, flexible environment that has lots of routines in it for uh, operating on images or measuring images. It has a lot of scripts that do the same thing, but you can also add scripts from the outside world. Scripts you've written, scripts that you got for free, scripts that you bought as a premium product. So it's a very expandable environment as well. Like I say, almost every serious asset photographer uses it. It has an enormously long learning curve. When I started using it, I absolutely hated it, hated it, hated it, hated it. A year later, I couldn't live without it. So it is a very powerful tool once you understand it. And it will handle processing and pre-processing. So it's nice to be able to do that all in one environment. That's what the environment looks like when you're done with the project. All these things at the top are various versions of the image along the processing path. These are all different masks that were created to target certain uh, aspects of the image you're trying to go after. There are some tools over there that operate on the image. But it's a nice environment for, and then you can capture that entire project and shrink it down, and then six months later, pick it up right where you left off and can you continue working with it. So it's, it's pretty handy. Now we're going to do the pre-processing. We have 300, almost 400 files. How do we boil them down to something useful? And we do that with a pre-processing step. Uh, this is my computer I built for that. It's a 12-core computer with lots of fast memory and lots of fast SSD drives so that I can process the data quickly. It can still take up to 10 hours to crunch all this data. So we got to combine everything together. It's often called stacking, but that's not really a good explanation of what it is. It handles issues with this, the chip itself. It does cosmetic correction. It does cr calibration and normalizations. It does image registration. Remember the dithering? You have to line it up. There's Sometimes the scope gets to a point where it can't go any further and track across the sky. It has to flip the weights in this telescope uh, end over end. And when it does that, everything turns upside down because you flip the scope. Well, all of a sudden your images are rotated. Registration has to handle all that. And finally, there's integration, which is not only putting it all together, but also rejecting pixels that have no business going into the final answer. Uh, the stacking process, obviously, is a smart one, right? You get a signal which isn't changes, changing frame to frame. It gets reinforced. Noise, by its nature, changes, and it, it gets averaged out. And basically, the signal and noise improves based on the square root of the number of subframes. So we have about 40 subframes. So we have about six and a half times better uh, signal to noise than we would have with a single subframe. If we wanted to go or double that to 12, I'd have to go up to 144 subs to get in that neighborhood. So we have the stack and we want to create that final image. Here's the difference between the two. I zoomed in. You can see noise. You can see stuck pixels. Um, but in the second image, the signal is the stars are a little bit more bold. The noise has dropped out. The stuck pixels are gone. Uh, the signal areas are reinforced and more visible, right? So that's what you're really trying to do with the pre-processing. So how does this work? And the way it basically works is, let's start with, we got these dark frames at 300 seconds. And that consists of bias noise and dark noise. We have a bunch of them. We're going to create a, a stacked version of that. So we have one master dark frame that we're going to be using for calibration. We also got darks from the flat frames because they're shorter exposures. And we have the same kind of information, but for a shorter, shorter exposure. Now we have our flat frames, which have all this noise and the flat data. We can subtract off the master uh, for that. That leaves me with calibrated flats, which we can then integrate and create a master flat. Now we come down to what we really want to deal with, which is our light image, right? So with our light image, we have this complete stack. We'll take this guy off to knock off the, the noise levels. We'll take this guy off to, to take care of the flat. Now we have calibrated lights that we just need to package together. So to think about this uh, another way, if you took one pixel and you realize that one pixel you had 30 samples for, you can do statistics on that. Average is a very good thing to do to figure out what the signal is. But you also, if you had plane going overhead, 
you have one pixel is very different than all the other pixels. You can use statistical uh, methods to clip that noise out so it never gets into the image. There's a tool that does all this inside PixInsight, allows you to load all the white frames, all the flats, all of it, all of the darks, and it takes care of everything. It creates a very long list of computations that it goes through where to do all that, and that's why it takes like forever. Now we can go on to the processing. And in the processing, uh, this is my workstation and my home office. I have uh, two 4K monitors that are calibrated, and that's the same computer I use for stacking I'm going to be using for everything else. That's your master image. You get all done. Ta-da! <laughs> uh, you can see a couple of bright stars, and that's about it. Why? Well, here is a histogram tool. You see the histogram. Oh, no, you don't. <laughs> That's because the histogram is stacked all the way up down here. And there are some things going all the way through. And you can see that by looking at the statistics. 26 megapixels. Uh, you can see that the maximum is 0.99. I should mention the 16-bit values are normalized from between 0 and 1. The 0.99. The minimum, though, is 0.0000504. And the average is way down to 00186. So you've got data there. But it's not data like you would see from any normal image that you're used to dealing with. And in order to see that better, I have to zoom in on this axis a little bit. Oh, there's the pixels. So most of the pixels from the nebulae are clustered down in a few hundred code values close to the one end. And you have stars that are filling up the entire spectrum all the way across. To work on that data, it's hard because you can't see it. So we put in a screen transfer function, which lets you visualize it without changing the actual values of the image. And that's what it would look like. So we have a linear domain, which is what we were just in, and a nonlinear domain. Nonlinear domain is where we've done stretching to the image, make the pixel values fill in a histogram over the code value so you can see it. But there are some things that are appropriate to do in the linear domain that are not appropriate to do in the nonlinear and vice versa. So linear, direct correspondence with a light source. So this kind of thing is very good for science, uh, very bad for visual appreciation. A lot of the processing I do there, I call residual calibration. You'll get gradients that are still in the image because of uh, light pollution gradients in the sky that didn't get taken out completely in calibration. We do things like color correction. Color correction in PixInsight is wild. It's not a, what's the bias and let me remove it. It's more like, let me recognize the stars in this scene. Let me go to an online database of all those stars. Let me find out their actual colors. Let me create a calibration model, mapping one to the other, and then let me normalize your image. Pretty nice stuff. Also, deconvolution. This is where you want to do that, right? Think about that. Deconvolution is something we can restore lost sharpness in an optical system. Hard to do unless you can have the, the, the spread function. I got stars, which are they're, they're theoretical point sources. I can measure that, and I can take it out. Problem is, it's very difficult to do. It takes me about an hour and a half per image to tweak and experiment to get everything right. And actually, in the astrophotographic community, there's kind of this dichotomy. Those that can do deconvolution successfully and those who can't. And if you can, you're hot stuff, right? That's all changing with deep learning coming along, which is making it easy to do these things. So, I'm sorry, the deconvolution process is about spatially varying, right? Because in the middle, you get a better the the edge and so well, that's an interesting thing is the best you can do right now with the tools that are available is create one uh, spread function model. But we know, like you said, it's variant, right, from the center of the edge. The deep learning actually takes advantage of taking windows and creating a spread function for each of the windows. So when you get aberration to the edge of the field, it'll fix the aberration. It's amazing. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Nonlinear is where you stretch it for visualization. This is all about making a pretty picture at this point. It's not science anymore. You want to see that there's data in there, and you want to bring it out so you can see what's there. You're teasing that out and trying to make it uh, visually useful. A couple of key issues we have to deal with. The signal extremes, stars versus faint things. In order to make the faint things visible, you have to stretch the tone scale like mad. But when you do that, you destroy the stars that weren't challenged for exposure to begin with. How do you handle it? The old way of doing it was to create a mask for all the stars that would protect them from being operated on. And creating robust maps for stars was an art form that few people got right, including myself. But now with deep learning, there are tools that do this very effectively. 
And um, this is a picture of my Lion Nebula. And I ran one of those tools on it, and I get a star completely devoid of, of stars, and the other just the stars. Now I can do two processing paths. Very different from what I want to do here from what I want to do there. And then I can put them back together. Sometimes I get fancy. Um, that, those are narrowband stars. Sometimes I'll shoot an RGB image, and I'll get real stars with re the right colors. And then I'll paste them on, and it makes it look even more natural. So you can play a lot of games. One guy out there is shaking up the entire image processing area. Uh, Russ Croman has a company called RC Astro. He personally got into deep learning. And the first thing he did is he trained a tool to take stars out. And it was a deep learning network. And it worked. There, and he was inspired by people who did this or tried to do it, put it in the public domain. I tried these tools, and they would leave behind blemishes where the stars were, ma making them not very useful. He improved upon it, and he created something which is state-of-the-art now. It takes the stars out so well, it leaves no blemishes. It's one, when I had that tool, I started to get involved in using it. But he went ahead and he created tools uh, for the other big issues, noise reduction and deconvolution. And that is really making a big impact on what's happening out there. The deconvolution, um, his controls are intuitive, and they just talk about aggressiveness. And in a few minutes, you have amazing restoration of signal. And it's variant from center to edge, so it's adaptive. Beautiful, beautiful tool. Uh, noise reduction. Pixinsight has about nine different methods for doing noise reduction, depending on where you are in the processing, what kind of image you're dealing with. And it's a PhD program to figure out how to use all those tools. This is one simple tool with an aggressiveness knob, and it does a beautiful job. It, it just takes hours out of my processing sometimes. And the star removal we already talked about. So this is my preferred workflow when I'm processing an image. I have these master images. I make a color image. And at this point, I run the blur exterminator, which is a deconvolution tool. It likes to work on color. So it looks at the three layers, and it doesn't screw up one layer compared to the others and cause rings on your stars, for example. And once that's been done, I now go starless and for my color image. But I also extract the stars from this. And that's my other processing path. I also, taking this image, I'll create a synthetic luminance image by combining the images together in a way that maximizes their signal and noise. Why do that? I'll process these for detail and sharpness. I process these for color and low noise. Then I can bring them back together and I have the best of both worlds. And then I can bring the stars back in. I also use a lot of masks so that I can take different components of the image and focus on what that component needs to emphasize that. This is what I like to do. I couldn't do that for this image. The reason was I had some thin clouds getting in there and that caused artifacts that I normally don't get with star exterminator. So I had to adapt and believe me, this adapting, this is very common even at the professional level in astrophotography. You get things that go wrong. You still have that data. What do you do to still use the data? So this is the processing path I actually ended up using. So I basically went into the color image, ran my deconvolution. Then I pulled them back out. I have each of the images. I went nonlinear, and then I emphasized the detail that I could get in each of those layers very, very carefully using masks. And then I have my final color image, but... Because I was trying to emphasize the shroud, I ended up realizing the shroud was only being shown in the HA signal and the O3 signal. So I created a synthetic luminance with a combination of those two, created a luminous image that I enhanced, sandwiched them back together, and that's what resulted in the final image. The thing that's interesting for these narrowband, look how different these images are, right? HA is the strongest signal. It's very lacy, right? You look at the oxygen three, it's soft, like angel wings. You look over and sulfur, no wings at all. So you can tell that most of the outer shells are made up of molecular oxygen and, 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 and hydrogen and have nothing to do with the sulfur. But I want to create a color image. How do I, it's not red, green, blue. How do I create color? Well, the way to do that, there's a lot of ways to do that, and I experimented with a lot, but the most common way is to use something called the Hubble palette. And in the Hubble palette, you basically take the sulfur, map it onto the red, the hydrogen, map it onto the green, and then finally this guy becomes the blue signal. 
And when you do that, you get an image that looks like that. Not very not the right color. It's green dominated because hydrogen is the strongest signal. But the next thing you want to do in these images is you want to take back take away any background gradients that might exist. So there's a tool called the background uh, extractor. And with that tool, I can put sample points on my image, avoiding stars and avoiding the nebula. It'll calculate a model for what the background looks like. And then I can start here, subtract that model, and I end up with something straightened out. And if you look at the background model, you can see there's a slight color and intensity shift one corner to the other. And we're able to take that out now. Doing it now in linear is better than doing it when you stretched it, because once you stretched it, it's a lot worse to deal with. So that's what it looks like after we've run that. So now we're going to do deconvolution. And I told it just to do the aberration correction, not the deconvolution. Here's the edge of my field where I'm starting to get in some aberration. You can see how it makes the stars, rounds them out, makes them very well behaved. Here's an example of what the deconvolution is doing to the image in here. The stars are getting a little bloated in here, right? All that convolution <laughs> through the atmosphere and the lenses and everything has been backed out. And then the features in the tenuous gas are becoming more sharp and more filled in. Then the final thing I do in linear is I just do a little noise. And the, the, the phrase used in the field is knock the fizz off the image. Just a little bit so that when you're, when you're starting to stretch it, you're not stretching too much noise. The, this is using the AI deep learning tool to take it out. It does a very nice job. So I mentioned I process with Mass. I create a lot of masks when I do my image processing. For something like this, I want to work on the core, so I'll create a mask that just covers the core. I might want to work on the entire nebula, so I'll create a mask that looks like that. And I might create one that just work on that outer halo. And I'll do that for here, too, because I have that signal in both. Might not do it so much on the others where there aren't as many regions that I want to work on. I talked about wanting to create a synthetic luminance channel. So here's the two that I'm using to go in. And that creates a channel like that, which is the best of both worlds. And it's a good channel to try to really enhance that faint outer shell. I was trying to figure out how do I compress three days of processing in a short talk. So I made a video where the image just goes snap, 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 and does that really, really quickly. But I'm running quite long here. So I think what I'm going to do instead is I'm going to skip through this one, and I'm going to show you the color one. You get a feel for kind of what happens. I can't do justice to us in the time we have today. So this is the color one. It starts out looking like that. And I'll do some color correction by inverting the image, working at both ends, apply a mask, do a little selective color enhancement. At this point, I'm, I'm uh, playing with tone scale. I'm doing uh, local histogram equalization to bring out some of the detail. I'm doing it at different scales, mid-scale and low-scale. Now I'm going after that color in the center. It got obscured a little bit. Started there, and I ended there. When I'm done with that, and I have the image I'm pretty happy with, I go to Photoshop now. Photoshop, I do a little tweaking, but mostly what I'm doing is I'm adding the watermarks in. Then I'm peeling off different versions. I need a version with the watermarks that is high-res. I need a version without the watermarks for submitting for publication. And I need something that's uh, small, but it's suitable for web pages. So I'll peel those images off. The other thing that I'll do is I'll create a finder chart that shows exactly where it is. And I'll create an annotated version. Now on this, there's only one big thing. There isn't much to see here. But when you have a wide field of view, it's fascinating because I shot object X. And then I run this thing, and I'm finding all these other things I didn't even know were there, and I can learn about them. And it's like I'm discovering them for the first time. I shot one image, and I shared it with a bunch of people, and they came back and said, great job, you even caught the bow wave from the black hole. I go, what? <laughs> what are you talking about? Well, it turns out that Cygnus X1 was the first black hole ever confirmed, is in an area where there's this big shock wave from it that you can see in glowing gas. And it was in my image. I didn't even know it. I didn't even see it. I said, but, but of course I caught it. Yes. <laughs> so here's the evolution. Very first image that I took, the best uh, broadband color image I took. I took this one two years ago, and then I redid the data this time. 
first time around, I was I really was able to show that background, but I didn't like the way the stars looked. And I thought I could bring out that outer shell a little bit more. And this is what I got this time around. The difference was the same data. It's just old tools versus new, old knowledge versus new, current inner eye versus the older inner eye. And it's part of that learning process you never really could get quite done with. Now, in astrophotography, how do you measure success? A lot of ways to do that. Most people talk about the fact that major magazines are willing to print your images. And it's really hard because there's 100,000 astrophotographers submitting things to these magazines, and you have to float above all that. This image was unique in that the first version of the image it was published in Amateur uh, Astrophotography Magazine and Astronomy Magazine. So I got two published, uh, two magazines published at that time. I resubmitted it for the ones that didn't publish it when I reprocessed it, and I got in Sky and Telescope and BBC Sky at Night. But the big one for me was a NASA, a NASA APOD. NASA APOD is an uh, astronomy picture of the day. They pick out an image to highlight. They have a professional astronomer analyze it. And you're competing against satellite images, professional observatory images, and a few morons out in their driveway all night. <laughs> I'd never gotten anything in until I got this image. And so this was chosen as a pod for May 30th of this year. So that was a very proud moment for me because I had other things printed, but nothing ever touched a pod. And that's a big deal in this community. I want to share with you a new image no one's seen yet. This is SH2-112. It's a diffuse emission nebula in, in Cygnus. I've, I've imaged a lot of things in the constellation Cygnus because the Milky Way goes right through the middle of it. Never heard of this, never seen it. When I researched it, I could find almost no information for it. This is not photographed that much or well known, and nor has it been particularly studied much. Um, but it's a beautiful, beautiful knot. It's, it looks like it's a, a planetary nebula with a, a concentration of oxygen towards the core of it, giving that blue color. This was shot in the clear weather we had uh, a week ago, and I finished processing it yesterday. So you guys get to be, see the first one. And given that we've been in a drought this year for new data, I was very happy to have some new data to have and to share with you today. So in conclusion, behind every successful astrophoto, you're going to find a lot of science. You're going to find a lot of methodology. You really have to have the methods down. A lot of time has gone into that. A little bit of our, and a lot of experience. And with that experience, there's a lot of really bad images that stack behind that good one that shows how you got there. And finally, for an astrophotography, you always save your data because you're going to have a cloudy time in the future. You're going to have better tools. You want to be able to use them and really get some new results. And this year, when I was skunked from getting new data, I had a good time pulling out old data and discovering much better images in the data than I was able to find in the past. And with that, thank you for being attentive. I know that was a long stretch, uh, but uh, I appreciate uh, your patience and uh, take any questions if you have any. Thank you. Yeah, Joe. I have one question was just answered by the, your last set of data. You don't necessarily need the second effects to be. No, I've had some projects where, you know, I had like really good night and a night and a half, and then the clouds moved in unexpectedly, but I didn't have critical mass of data. And in one case, I remember it was 30 days later, I finally had some clear, and I went and I captured two more nights of data, and I was able to put them together. I know people who've done this spanning years. Like um, sometimes when you have something uh, low in the sky and you don't have the ability to have a lot of time to capture it, they'll capture a little bit for every year. And when they think they have enough, they'll process it. Uh, with all the weather things, you learn a lot of patience. That's part of it, I guess. But yeah, you can you can do some amazing things. There are people who have published images, went back and shot more data, took the data from that image, took the new data, put it together, and now they have a new image completely. So very, very flexible. And they're like just tracing the KKR on an end image and just tracing them. Yep, yep. The, the image registration uh, is very, very powerful. And uh, I never could figure out exactly. I, I, was, I remember when I first started, when the, the meridian flip of the telescope would cause the images halfway through to go upside down, I thought that I was going to have to change their orientation manually in order to put them together. So I started doing that. And one of the fellows that I that that I grouped up with, who was a more you know sophisticated imagery, saying, "Knock that off! You don't have to worry about that." 
Same token, every time I had a, a, you know, a plane go through an image, I was throwing those frames out. I had another guy come up, slap me on the head and said, no, this, it's smart enough to throw those pixels out. All the other data in that image is good. It's hard fought. It's hard won. Don't throw out that data. Use the algorithms in order to go after it. And I just talked about stacking from a very superficial. But if you look at like the rejection algorithms, that software will provide 12 different rejection strategies, all statistically based, all based on do you have five subframes or 105 subframes? And you can, and it gets more and more sophisticated and smarter in how it does that rejection. We also create the final map and the rejection map. And it's amazing sometimes to see what got rejected that was in your images, right? If you'd say, have precise rotators, tell us what you've done but I didn't really see what we uh, yeah, you won't see those because if you could, my wife would hurt me. Um, I have a black top driveway and I have dark uh, brown spray paint spots for the, where each leg has to drop. Um, it's not very noticeable, but I can see it even at night. So I, I tried to do this once and I had bright white paint and I was informed that that was not going to be an acceptable solution. So. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I think to a great extent they do. Uh, there's one fellow by the name of Adam Block who's considered to be kind of the penultimate expert on image processing with PixInsight. And the reason he's so good is he's a professional astronomer. Um, and one of his specialties is dealing with data sets that have some uh, corruption or some problem in it. That means the normal methods can't be used. And so they will go to him and he'll use these tools to work around that data, you know, to get a useful something out of it. Now, I think there's a difference though. Um, when you're doing pure science, you're working at the linear level and you don't want anything disrupting that. And it's like in the old days when they were discovering things in the universe, they would take glass plates and it was very important. They had exactly the same exposure all the time because they would put two plates in a plate comparator and blink your eyes between the two. And you're looking for stars that suddenly got brighter or moved or something like that. And you had to have the plates be very consistent. So they were, you know, all about consistency in their processing. I have to believe that when they're doing true science with this data, it's the same thing. The data processing has to be done such that you don't break that correspondence with what the sensor saw. But when they go to show it to someone else, I think they're using very similar methodologies, right? Maybe using data sets that you're using to get the limit. That's right. It seemed to me that somebody who's doing what you're doing would have real insight for astronomy in the data extraction. Yeah, I think that you, know, you do. It's interesting as you work with the data. You get to know when the data is looking right or looking wrong. You just, you develop a feel for it. And, you know, suddenly something's going on. And you realize there's a problem with your camera and you didn't know it, right? I mean, those things really come out. But um, one of the things that I learned along the way is if you want to tru have a truly great astrophoto, then starting from the very first part of your imaging chain to the back, you look at all the little details, even the minor things because it's a summation of all that that pushes you over to the edge. And as you get more and more serious into this, and you get into the more elites, and I, I'm not there. I mean, I've been doing this for four years, and I'm getting nice images, but there are people out there who are just, they do things that I'm in awe of. And those people um, really, I think, have gotten to the point where uh, it's at a different level completely. Go. Well, it's possible. You don't have a big dark sky, well, you're still talking signal to noise. I mean, for example, when I'm going after a galaxy, I have a dark sky, I have a black background, and I have a very diffuse portion of the galaxy. Moon comes out, the background sky comes up, and I lose that. Now, where you're right is when I'm doing nebula imaging and I'm using the narrowband filters. Narrowband filters can throw out a lot of like light pollution. Um, a hydrogen alpha filter is really good at illuminating moonshine, right? Moonlight. Uh, but the oxygen-3 filter can't. So sometimes you get strategic when you have good weather. Uh, the moon's starting to get in the way. I'll do hydrogen alpha that night. When uh, the moon's not there yet, that's when I'm going to do my oxygen-3. Right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. 
solution in the driveway compared to say timber lakes or uh, well don't get me wrong i'm i'm doing okay where i'm at uh, but we've been uh, as much as it's fun imaging from a driveway uh, my wife and i have been looking for two years now to buy property that's in a darker location that we can build a house on and more importantly an observatory uh, but it's a crazy market and it's tough to find what we're looking for right now without being so far from the city that you can't conveniently get into the city for services right but the darker your skies are the better your signal to noise this game is all about signal to noise right managing noise is in everything you do right uh, maximizing the signal is in everything you do and if the sky's at a disadvantage um, I know people in the city who've done amazingly good images using narrowband, right? And so more power to them. They're maximizing what they can do with the situation they have. But if you ask them, they would love to be in darker skies because the results would be better. I've asked this before, I'll ask you again here in this one. Um, a big fat mirror is cheap compared to a, a, a fairly small uh, uh, objective. Um, I think you mentioned this before that it's just not practical to get a, a big 12 inch uh, reflector. Um, what are the pros and cons of the refractor telescope versus a... That's a, that's a really good question because, you know, when I was involved in astronomy 30 years ago, it was visual, so it was all about light buckets. I have a Dobsonian telescope, which has a 14-inch mirror, and a Dobsonian telescope has no drive on it. It just has slip clutches, alt azimuth slip clutches, and you nudge it around and look. But it's a light bucket, and you can see things. So when I started looking for my new telescope once I retired... I was thinking light bucket and I'd probably go with a reflector. Um, and there's, there's a, there's a kind of a trade off. I was shocked to see most astronomy and most imaging was done with smaller refractors. I was shocked by that. I just assumed just like you, why not get a big thing? I think the problem with a big tube like that is first problem that you have is, um, it's big and heavy and bulky and it's hard to get a drive that will be as precise in, in positioning it. And the kinds of errors you get get scaled up by it. That's the first problem. Second problem is most of those are not sealed systems. So you have air currents inside the tube. You have a big, heavy mirror that takes a long time to come to thermal equilibrium. Um, so there's a lot of issues that you run into there. And the final thing is a lot of these fast mirrors, um, on one hand, you're reflecting the light off of the surface of the glass, so you don't get chromatic aberration, but you'll get coma and a lot of other issues that you get from a reflector as well. So it's kind of a trade-off. I think when people try to go bigger, they often go with a Cassegrain or a, 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 an RC design because they can still sort of have a sealed environment. It's a little bit smaller. You don't have that big lever arm uh, on a mount. Um, and that goes, uh, you look at observatories, they started building refractors until they got to 44 inch refractors. The largest refractor in the world is 44 inches in New York City's observatory in Wisconsin. What they discovered there is you have to support that lens by its edge and the weight of the glass causes it to deform. And then you had to have these really long tubes that don't deflect, but they do deflect. So they had to create them. So they deflected equally to keep the optical alignment, right? Um, they quickly realized if you can go to a bigger telescope, it's better to go with a mirror and you get better quality when you're doing a mirror and doing spectroscopy, well, things like that. Um, you really like to have a mirror, but they can afford these super big, heavy mounts to handle them, which is really not within the grasp of most uh, amateurs. For me, I like the refractor because um, it's a sealed system and I can lift it. <laughs> it's not something that's going to break my back. My, knee, my knees are bad. My back is bad. Carrying heavy things is not something I enjoy. So this is about at the limit of what I want and it works quite well. And in fact, if I was to do this all over again, I would have started with a much smaller telescope with a wider field because all the alignment issues and the guiding issues and the errors you get are much smaller and they don't contribute to your result as much. It's a much more forgiving system to learn on. But I decided I needed this bigger one. And so I had to learn some things the hard way. But when people ask me now, what should I start with? I tell them to start with an 80 millimeter diameter telescope. You can do wonderful imaging with that and alignment issues and all these other issues aren't as critical and it's a forgiving environment to start with. Okay, thank you very much. Very good, thanks, Matt. Parting gift, a certificate of appreciation. Oh, thank you so much. showing up and giving us your time and uh, thank you so much. I appreciate that, I really do. That's great, thank you.